Thank you. Welcome to this time of worship, Tuesdays in the chapel on this November 10th. We are glad you have joined us. Hear now the call to worship. Our hearts are full of praise, O oh God, because of your wonderful works. You are almighty, the king of creation, over which you rule with kindness and justice. You prosper and sustain us so that we can serve you in your kingdom now and through eternity. Come, Holy Spirit, help us worship God in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment to catch our breath with a silent prayer and meditation. pray. Lord, open unto me, open unto me light for my darkness, open unto me courage for my fear, open unto me hope for my despair, open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me, thyself, for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Amen. Before I read the scripture, I want to introduce our guest for this afternoon. Reverend Scott Alridge is District Superintendent of the Cumberland River District of the Tennessee Conference of the United Methodist Church. He sees his mission to be to discover, equip, connect, and send spiritual leaders who offer Christ. What a gift. He works over 100 churches and pastors in this district. And he and his wife, Beth, live in Henderson with their, Hendersonville with their children, James and Lindsay. And by the looks at things, we are going to be um, challenged and uplifted this afternoon. So um, look forward to hearing Reverend Allridge. The scripture comes from Nehemiah 2.14. So I went up the valley in the dark, continuing my inspection of the wall. I came back in through the valley gate. The local officials had no idea where I'd gone or what I was doing. I hadn't breathed a word to the Jews, priests, nobles, local officials, or anyone else who would be working on the job. 
Let's start rebuilding, they said, and they eagerly began the work. It's good to see all of you this day. It is my hope that if you've come here in this moment, that God will speak a word into your life, and that if I get in the way, that uh, God will still speak a word into your life. So my hope in this moment, this time that we have together, is that um, God might continue rebuilding our lives in the midst of this season. Let us pray, shall we? And whatever that you might need, I ask that you go to God for that. Let us go to God. Gracious and loving Lord, as we come to this moment, I pray, dear Lord, that your Holy Spirit continue to reign upon this place, dear Lord, in a time more than ever we need you, gracious God. So come, Holy Spirit, come, fill our hearts, gracious Lord, guide our steps in Christ's name. Amen. I'm using the background of Nehemiah just for this, uh, these words today. In our district, in the Cumberland River District, for the last year or so, we started focusing on Nehemiah, and the theme was, let us build, let us rebuild. At that time, that was before the General Conference decided not to meet. That's where churches were struggling. That's where people were in disarray. That was even before COVID. Does any of this sound familiar to you today? Who would have thought that we'd be sitting eight months later in the midst of this time in which many people have lost their lives, in which we would have an election in which nobody seems to be celebrating, and we find ourselves in this moment, and yet we go into the Scriptures, and even in a time long ago, God spoke, and God used a character of Nehemiah. Just to remind you what might have been happening, if you don't remember the story of Nehemiah, so Nehemiah, the kingdom of Jerusalem had been split, things had changed, people were in a bad way. Nehemiah was in a distant land, a, a kingdom, and his brother comes and he just has a conversation. He says, Hanai, how's it going in Jerusalem? And in that moment, he says, it's not good. The wall is down, the protection the spiritual understanding of who they were and who they were as a people and a place have been stripped to nothing. Things aren't good, brother. Does any of that sound familiar? Had you ever gone to a place in which you didn't know about something bad that had happened? It had been a couple years. I had served at Columbia First, and a few months ago I had asked them about a particular person and they had passed away two years earlier, and it hit me like a rock. Even though it was old information, it was new information for me. Has anybody ever experienced hearing something that just shakes you a little bit? So we find Nehemiah in this place, a place that was different, a place like he hadn't experienced before, a place in which everything he understood was not the same. Weddings have been put off. Funerals are isolated around the graveyard. Family members who we want to touch and hold are not the same. And it seems to us that we are wearing masks in order to protect ourselves from something we don't even know what it is, but we do know when it happens, people get ill. Does any of this make you want to cry? Nehemiah, we're told, he starts to weep. He starts to weep about what had happened in Jerusalem. Has anybody cried in the last eight months other than just me? There are days where I just start crying because I'm not sure what I am to do next. A hundred plus churches, 150 pastors, and at some points in times we're all going, this is a bad Groundhog Day movie. Does that relate to anybody? So then we find that what Nehemiah does next, he starts praying. Now I've prayed a lot. Sometimes I've lamented. Sometimes I've prayed for change. And then finally there comes a prayer of God just help me sustain where I am now. Is that, now look, you guys, I know you can't talk because you got these baskets, but you can raise your hand, right? Because we're going to, 
I haven't been with people in a long time, you know, so I'm a little excited. <laughs> but there are a few things, and I, I, I hate to be a three-point pastor, and I'm not trying, but there are some things that I think happen in the midst of this story that stick out. I think Nehemiah goes through something that I think that God still uses for us today. Nehemiah starts to have a head change. He has to think different about the situation. And so we find in this text that Nehemiah gets permission from the king to go to Jerusalem, and we find him himself at night going and checking out this destruction of the wall, and he looks at it for himself, and he comes back and he's honest with everybody. He says, you know what? We're in a bad way here. So I'm just going to be honest with you all. 2020, November, after an election that we thought might settle everything, we're in a bad way here. United Methodist Church, churches in general, our nation at times, and yet this is what he says next. But let us rebuild. Now, for many people, they were like, you've got to be kidding me. We have none of the original stone. We're in disarray. Where are we going to get the money? And he says, let us rebuild. He starts changing the way he's thinking. I don't know about you, but that's one thing that I've come to the conclusion now is that I've got to think different about the way I'm looking at this world because I know who's in charge, God. God has always been in charge. God always will be in charge. And through the blood of Jesus, that tells me that it's going to be all right. Now, it's not going to be easy. And it hadn't been easy. Can you imagine how people responded when he said, let us rebuild? You've got to be kidding me. He said, come on. Let us rebuild. And he has this head change. And then it tells me he starts using his hands. Sometimes you and I don't need to understand everything. We just need to go and start using our hands to do something. I don't know about you, but has anybody's hands filled idle in this time? You can look, I'm gonna keep on asking that question. Just pause if you guess yes or no, or heck. Your hands, my hands have felt idle at times. Because as a pastor, we used our hands a lot. We touched people, we anointed people, we did communion with people, we waved them around, whatever. And yet, we haven't been able to use our hands because we can't even touch people. And if we touch them, what do we do next? We put a little, little stuff on it to wipe them off, right? I've never been so clean in my whole life. And yet, during this time, I've never been so dirty. Mmm. I suspect that many of us are in the same spot. I got off Facebook because I couldn't take it anymore. The people I loved and cared about, who I might have disagreed or agreed with, were saying things that were dirty. And I thought to myself, in the midst of this, maybe God is saying, Scott, you don't have to have completely figure it out, but you've got to do something with your hands. So Nehemiah starts doing, with it, doing something with his hands. He calls everybody together. And they start getting stuff together to rebuild. This is the Jenga game. Anybody ever played this game before? This game, I have played this game by myself, and I've built it really high. And then what happens after you build it, you know, you pull out a little thing, and it builds up higher, and then you, and it falls over. Now, I'm going to tell you, this game is okay to play by yourself, but it's a lot more fun when you play it with people. And so Scott can rebuild, I can build this particular thing any way that I want to, but it sure doesn't make sense unless I do it with people together. I believe that God is calling us right now, right here in this place, us that call ourselves Christians or those of us who think that we're a Christian or those of us who want to be a Christian, God is calling us to rebuild something better than it was before, not in the way we have built it, but maybe the way God wants us to build it. Now, it may be a little shaky. We might have to reset it. Nehemiah calls all those people together, and he says, okay, here's the deal. Just first rebuild your own home. Build it behind you. Build a protection about, behind your own house. Now, everybody likes to do stuff for themselves. Everybody goes, yeah, I'm into that. And then he says, hey, maybe you can help your neighbor. The scripture tells us that 
neighbors start helping each other. Because you know what? You, you want to help your neighbor, right? Because if your friend's out doing something, your neighbor needs a little help, eh, you kind of trust them, you're willing to do that. But then something else happened. They start building together. But guess what happened in the midst of all this building? There was trouble. Throughout Nehemiah, you get these three characters that, that just don't like him. They talk about him. They write letters about him. They, 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 in their day, text about him. They post about him. And Nehemiah, every time, stops and prays. In fact, at one particular point, right before they got ready to set the city gate, the gates, the, the big moment here, he's called, they said, hey, meet us on, let's celebrate what you're doing. This guy calls him and says, let's meet on this plane of Ono and let's celebrate. But his intention was to do him harm. And Nehemiah says, I'm not meeting you. Why should I stop what I'm doing, what God wants me to do, to come do something that you want me to do? Do you know now what God wants you to do? What do you need to say yes to, and what do you need to say no to? What do you need to build up, and what do you need to get rid of so it doesn't tear you down? The people of God are called right now. Here's the, we, can, we can spread the gap. This is our moment. This is where the church, this is where people call ourselves Christians. This is where we stand up and stand out. It's not when things are going great. It's when things aren't going good for the people of God. Right now, especially in our nation, the church should be the one that bridges the gap between those who see things differently. A head change. Start using our hands so that we have a heart change. Am I the only one here that needs a heart change? Am I the only one here that needs to forgive and be forgiven? What is it in your life, for whatever reason that brought you here, that you might need to say, I need forgiveness, or I need somebody to forgive me? Am I the only one? Yes, probably. I've got two teenagers at home. Anybody ever have teenagers at home? This morning, my daughter told me she had basketball practice at 5.30. And then she had to be picked up again and brought back to school. Where she didn't speak to me for that hour and a half. I was so mad. Because it was something that I thought I needed. Rather than just being present for what she needed. Where are you at? What are those little things? What is your story of life going to be like? Nehemiah's story, we know his story. When he got to a point where everything got together and they finally got everything together, he let somebody else take over. He got it to a point and then he cleared out. What's the story of your life looking like? What's the next story that we need to tell for our nation? What's the next story that we need to write for the church? What's the next story we need to write for ourselves? So here's the thing. This, this is a text that I heard this morning that I thought, it's from Titus. It's Titus 11. And it reminds us, I think, of, I don't know why it hit me, but it just did. Here's what said. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to the lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the one who gave himself for us, that we might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous and for good deeds. Declare these things, exhort and reprove from all authority, let no one look down on you. When's the last time in this time you told somebody about the grace and love of our Savior? Here's what I'm going to tell you today. 
And I don't think we say it enough. God loves you. What's it about? What's the whole Bible? And what do we, God loves you. But I'm not like, God loves you. But Scott, you don't know what I've done. God loves you. But you don't know what's in my heart. God loves you. But I'm not who I need to be. God loves you. If God can love me, then I darn well know that God can love you. And if you don't hear anything else I've said today, know this. Christ died because he loved you. Christ arose because he loved you. And I'm betting my life on it. Christ will come again because he loves you. And all God's people should say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. As um, we come to a close in this service, let's respond to this message with, O oh God, our help in ages past. And if you'd like to stand wherever you are, um, verses 1, 2, and 6. benediction. Go forth from this place in peace. Go forth knowing your faith is the assurance you hope for. Leave this service, not yet having received all the promises of God, but seeing them in the distance. Press on in faith. Amen.